<laughs> Hi guys. <laughs> hey lady. <laughs> yeah, like um, how we're separated. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, really. <laughs> old school one today. side, girls in the other. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, it's good morning. Um, all right. Everyone knows me. I'm Dries. Pediatric ophthalmologist. Retinoblastoma. Other uh, ocular tumors. That's what this is about. But uh, let's put your thinking cap on. Good morning. So look at some slides. I'm just going to show you some tumors, right? And then you tell me, no, keep it to yourself. What do you think it is? <laughs> no, it's good. Maybe it has something to do with the title. <laughs> oh, it's harder. Now you got to pay attention. So this is this is what OCAPs and how old is the person? Year and a half. Randomized them. <laughs> <laughs> it was like here's, the, here's the first quiz OCAP ish oh, <laughs> slide. Okay. Got it. What is it? What is it? Oh, my RV. <laughs> Who's the second one? Got oh, it. sorry. <laughs> it's a sec different patient. This is. This. What is it? <laughs> yeah. There's number three. Okay. Okay. Anyone who gets this based on the photo is far smarter than I am. That's a hard, right? A little bit of nodding. So this is kind of what, you know, OCAPS is like. Yeah. <laughs> Not much information. Actually, zero. I'm giving you zero. They're all kids, all little kids. So many of these you're not going to know the exact diagnosis, but you should be able to come up with a differential, some idea. That one you should have the exact diagnosis. There's pattern recognition on that one. So we'll get back to those slides at the end, and hopefully from this lecture you'll be able to figure out better the differential diagnosis for each of those clinical photos and even the diagnosis on some of them. So first, an overview of retinoblastoma, an update on treatment. I'll talk about genetic testing and um, counseling. We'll talk about empiric risk of, of another kid having retinoblastoma when one kid's diagnosed with it. And then we'll talk about the genetics behind that. And that's pretty damn confusing, right? <laughs> It confuses everyone, and so it's always thrown on the OCAPs. So I'm going to try to prepare you for your OCAPs, but also help you understand clinically the complexity behind those difficult questions about what's the chance the next kid is going to have retinoblastoma. It seems to always come up. Um, and of course, the family wants to know. Retinoblastoma is the most common intraocular tumor of childhood. There's no race, sex, uh, seasonal uh, predilection about 350 to 500 new cases per year in the United States as of a couple decades ago. Um, this is kind of interesting. 90% don't, 90%, 9 out of 10 have no family history, but you know there's tons of genetics behind this, right? So I'm just going to ask this question, just let this sit in your mind. For those 9 out of 10 kids with no family history, where are those mutations coming from? How, there's a mutation in the RB, in one of the RB genes, right? So where's it coming from if there's no family history? So just think about that, okay? Just hold that question in your mind because it's something we'll talk, get to. And um, yeah, most are unilateral. Um, and uh, 
seventy percent unilateral, about thirty percent bilateral. Look, if they're bilateral, they've got what's called a germline mutation, right? If they're unilateral, they might. They usually don't, though. Eighty-five percent don't have a germline mutation. Okay. We'll dive into the genetics later to understand that. Um, you know, when retinoblastoma is heritable, it's uh, inherited in an, the risk of it is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. But a tumor arises at the cellular level because two genes have a mutation. So it's autosomal recessive at the genetic level. But the risk is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. Um, and then if you do inherit one of the RB alleles with a mutation, the penetrance is 90%. So 10% chance you won't get any tumors, even if you do inherit the gene. Um, look, in Sudan and Africa with no health care, you can die for, from retinoblastoma. In the developed world, you almost can't. I mean, there is some mortality, supposedly, in the Western world, but we find this and uh, generally cure it. If it's untreated and undiagnosed, though, optic nerve and choroidal invasion occur and ultimately extraocular spread. Look at that kid. Who's the most astute person in the room? Me, because I've been doing this for 25 years. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but take a look at that kid. What do, you, what do you see? Look at that kid. What do you see with that kid? Dive deep. Look at the... Uh, leukocoria, right? Okay, so that, that pretty much any ophthalmologist will get that, right? Look at the kid's face. Is that face normal? Look at the filtrum. Look at the lips. Look at the nose. That's, that's, uh, that filtrum is really long. Those lips turned down. So, this is a kid with a chromosomal deletion spanning one of the RB alleles. Does that make sense? So that's just, just a little tip for you, okay? If you lose a, a big chunk of chromosome and one of the RB alleles is in that big chunk of chromosome, um, you'll get 90% penetrance, you have 90% chance of retinoblastoma, but in addition to that, you'll have seizures, mental retardation, abnormal facies, that's what that kid has. Um, usually, though, so how, how does this present? This kid actually presented with seizures to the ER, and an ER doc picked up the leukocoria. Pretty cool. Uh, but usually, it's leukocoria that's seen, and usually, it's the parents. Who's always right? Every lecture I say this, come on. Who's always right? Mom. Mom's always right. And so if mom sees something wrong with the pupil, mom's right. Sometimes dad's. But mom's almost always right. And um, there are unusual presentations, though, like strabismus, because there's a macular tumor, poor vision, eye starts wandering, right? Um, and then late, late, you know, advanced retinoblastoma, like glaucoma, hypopian, hyphema, that's pretty weird in the US. It's usually picked up before that. And um, how else does it present? Trilateral? Anyone ever, ever heard of trilateral retinoblastoma? It's bilateral retinoblastoma with a pineal blastoma in the brain. It's horrible. It's fatal. Okay. That, that uh, can happen with heritable retinoblastoma. Finally, uh, something like 35 cases ever reported in the literature of uh, uveitis masquerade called diffuse infiltrating retinoblastoma with a median age of diagnosis of about five years. Years. Five years, that's weird. Kids with retinoblastoma present the first two years of life, right? So, but I'm sure Dr. Vertel and Akbar can touch on that too. Um, if it's bilateral, usually by one year it's diagnosed, and if it's unilateral, usually by two years it's diagnosed. And uh, parents pick this up. Parents listen carefully to parents. So, these masses are start in the retina, the obscure vessels, they're white, sort of creamy white. When they're uh, small, they look like this. When they get bigger, they fill the eye. 
that's what you're seeing uh, on, on the opposite side there. That's just vitreous full of tumor up against the lens. Same thing here. High mag photos, okay? You're just looking at, let me get you oriented. You're just looking at the edge of a tumor here. The retina's down here and the tumor's way. It's a huge mass, okay? Look at the vessels. They're dilated, they're feeder vessels. Feeder vessels are dilated tortuous with tumors, growing tumors. You know, things that are more benign, the vessels tend not to do that. Um, imaging studies, calcification, 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 right? And, uh, that diagnosis, retinoblastoma, although rarely Coates disease can have some calcium. Ugh, it's so frustrating. But calcification is the hallmark the imaging studies and ultrasound and CT are the best ways to find it. Might want to stay away from uh, radiation in these kids, right? Because if they have inherited a mutation in an RB allele, uh, in an RB gene, every cell in their body's got it, and they're at risk of non-ocular tumors, sarcomas, melanomas, and if you irradiate part of the body, you're raising a risk of a second hit. Um, we also like to image the optic nerve to see if there's any, uh, I don't think this is that important, but there's endophytic and exophytic growth patterns into the vitreous in the subretinal space. Prognosis is a little different based on the nucleation. We're nucleate, nucleating fewer and fewer kids, uh, but that's what it looks like with the growth path. And then this is the histopath. Flexner, Wintersteiner, Rosettes, the central lumen, specific for RB, okay? Um, this is what optic nerve invasion looks like. Ick, 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 that means systemic chemotherapy. Here's choroidal inflammation, uh, infiltration. Um, treatment advances, uh, well, treatment of retinoblastoma, where do I start? The 20th century? You can remove an eye. Uh, if there's zero visual potential, and you can remove it, and save a life, and you're done. Prosthetic eye. So that's not a bad thing, but we try to salvageize, of course, if we can, and salvage as good a vision as we can. Sometimes it's so advanced, though, that we just uh, there's no visual potential at all. Flat ERG, afferent pupillary defect, eye completely full of tumor, and. Um, you know, that's, it's a really nice treatment because it gets this, I mean, done. No chemotherapy, no, no um, um, long, prolonged course throwing, radioactive flax, external proton, external beam radiation, uh, intravascular and intravitreal chemotherapy. I mean, it's a long, hard course if you try to salvage an eye. So sometimes just removing the eye. But you got to prepare the parents, you know. It's really hard. I don't know. Who has kids? I have kids. Do you have kids? I can't remember. Anyone? Yeah? No. It, it, it's really hard. What's that? You, that you know. That's why they're not here. They have kids. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so external beam radiotherapy has fallen out of favor, but we still use uh, <coughs> accurate proton beam radiation selectively for advanced retinoblastoma that is resistant to other treatments. With radiation, that's what the regression looks like, so-called cottage cheese regression. Um, and another way to give radiation is, is a plaque. It's um, iodine plaque. It's sewn external to the sclera and left there for a certain number of hours to give a specific dose of radiation. Um, it can be used for tumors that are medium-sized, that other treatments are not eradicating. For example, intravascular chemotherapy to shrink a tumor, cryotherapy or laser, and it's still recurring. This is a, a nice treatment choice. But it, it can't irradiate the entire vitreous cavity. So if there's diffuse vitreous seeding, it doesn't work. The local treatments, generally um, local <coughs> treatments like cryotherapy and laser. For tiny tumors, it works alone. But we usually don't diagnose this when the tumors are tiny. Um, and so they have to be shrunk with systemic chemotherapy to get them down to the size where these local treatments work. Um, and uh, with vitreous seeding, you can't 
eradicate venturi seeds with, with laser cryo. You can't. Okay. So it's got to be local circumscri circumscribed small or shrunk tumors. Um, um, I'll just touch on uh, systemic chemotherapy. You know, I'll just touch on the, the risks of it, neutropenia, infection risk, risk of induced, inducing hematologic malignancy down the road, and these are the chemotherapeutic agents that are generally used. Um, so this is what tumor shrinkage and local treatment with laser looks like. Here's baseline photo before treatment. This is after chemo and one laser Here's more, after more laser. And finally, I think that's the last one. Finally, it's eradicated. Those are flat. They were elevated here. Now it's flat, it's just scar. So it works really nicely. And look, the phobia is purpose preserved. So you, you know, you can get 20-20 vision in these eyes. Uh, intravascular chemotherapy is, uh, <coughs> it, was, it, was, it was just like, uh, the second coming of Christ. It was like, there were 20 cases with Dr. Abramson in New York about, I don't know, 15 years ago, and it was like, oh, this is fantastic. We just put a catheter up there and squirt, squirt, and we just get the eye. And then, um, you know, in the beginning it was great, but like all new therapies, sooner or later complications tend to emerge. And uh, ocular ischemia started to emerge, which kind of makes sense, right? Who knows what ocular ischemic syndrome is? Stenosis of the ophthalmic artery, right? How does that present? A dying eye, if you will, uh, an eye starved of oxygen. So it's the same kind of thing. And some of these kids will have uh, lost their eye to nucleation because of that uh, complication. But it definitely helps avoid systemic exposure to the chemotherapeutic agents and the side effects like neutropenia, infection risk, and later malignancy. Um, and this is used for the, you know, the advanced retinoblastoma, when you gotta just shower the whole eye with chemo, right? That kind of makes sense. Um, so secondary primary tumors, I mentioned, if you inherit a mutation in one of the RB genes, it's in every cell in your body, right? So you can get non-ocular tumors. And uh, yeah, I won't dive too deep into these numbers, but um, you know, a 30-year cumulative incidence uh, without radiation is pretty high. We're talking like a 1% per year, per year risk, and it's cumulative over time, right? So 30% risk over 30 years without any radiation. If you get a radi radiation to treat the retinoblastoma, then that risk is greater than 1% per year cumulative. So we try to avoid radiation. and surveillance is really important and really driving home to the families that another cancer could be coming. You know, one in three chance in the next 30 years and, and they're, they're bad ones. You know, sarcoma. Um, okay, so before I, uh, uh, let me see. Okay, let me back up. I'll talk about the molecular genetics of retinoblastoma in a moment, but let me let me do the, the OCAP questions. Here, here, here are the OCAP questions. And uh, parents want to know this stuff too. So two parents, their first child, parents have never heard of retinoblastoma. There's no one in the family with any kind of childhood cancer, let alone eye cancer. And their baby has bilateral retinoblastoma. And they, at the end of the visit, they look up and say, I'm pregnant. What, what's the chance that my second child has this? What's the empiric risk? What's the correct number? The empiric risk at that point. You don't know anything about this, the mom's genetics, the dad's genetics, you have no genetic testing. Just what's the empiric risk? 
lower. Oh, is it a percent of that? Fox. Yeah. Yes. Percent yes, like five, six percent. Now, how on God's green earth? It's because it's, it's it's random. If if they have, I, I, if they're normal. Yeah. Well, we don't know that they're normal. I guess, right? Oh, I guess I was assuming they want the mom had one and the dad had one. No, we want to know that. So really happy you guys are discussing this because that um, is great thinking because you're thinking about autosomal dominance inheritance and autosomal recessive inheritance, right? Um, but you remember at the beginning of the lecture, I said, where are these mutations coming from? Okay, where are they coming from? So here are two parents minding their own business, having a baby, it's got bilateral retinoblastoma and mom's pregnant. Ask the question, where did that mutation come from in that first child? And there are lots of ways that baby can get the mutation, okay? And I'm gonna dive into that in a moment and just, uh, you know, bear the uncertainty of not knowing why at 6% right now I'm gonna get there. But it's six percent. Bizarre. You think it'd be much higher, right? But but it's six percent, and I'm and I'm gonna go into that now. Let me do it differently, okay? Different family. Parents are completely normal. They've never heard of retinoblastoma. They have a baby, and it's unilateral retinoblastoma, not bilateral, but unilateral retinoblastoma. And mom has a dry mouth and says, "I'm pregnant." What's the chance that my next child has retinoblastoma? And the empiric risk is about, do you guys know it? Do you want me to say it? One. Yeah, like one, one to two percent. Okay, so it's really low. <coughs> so why so damn low when, when the risk is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion? Well, I'm gonna tell you, okay. First, let's understand the molecular genetics. There are two RB genes at that locus. Unlucky chromosome number 13. That's how I like to teach it. It's unlucky chromosome number 13. So maybe you'll remember which chromosome. Um, and the, the protein is not, of course, it's involved with cell regulation, differentiation, and growth. Okay. And um, both genes, paternal and maternal, must have a mutation in a single cell for that single cell to turn into a cancer with uncontrolled cell division. Okay? So at the molecular genetic level, that's a key point. Both, both genes have to have a mutation. This is what it looks like. And, and, and how, how can it happen? How can you get both genes with a mutation, paternal and maternal? Well, it can happen uh, by random chance in both genes. By random chance, it can happen in both genes during normal mitosis in retinoblast division, okay? And so here's a normal gene, maternal and paternal. Over time, there's a cell division, there's a mutation in one of the two genes, and then a deletion in a chromosome with a second mitotic cell division, and that single cell turns into a retinoblastoma. But every other cell in the body of that baby does not have a mutation in either of the two RB genes, right? So there's no genetic risk that the next kid is gonna have retinoblastoma, and there's no genetic risk that that child's offspring will have retinoblastoma, okay? And that's how most retinoblastomas arise, okay? Uh, the heritable type of retinoblastoma, though, there's an inherited germline mutation in one gene, and then during mitosis of retinoblast, the second gene gets deleted or mutated. And not surprisingly, this process can happen more than once if every retinoblast in the developing eyes of a baby has the first gene mutated, there's a greater chance that there'll be a second mutation in more than one cell in the eyes, and so you get multiple tumors in bilateral retinoblastoma. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, there are all kinds of different mutations, uh, and it always takes two mutations, 
and I just described non-heritable retinoblastoma. Okay? It always takes two hits. Both genes have to be mutated. Um, it just This happens by random chance because of the number of mitotic cell divisions during retinal, during retinal development. Um, so you understand the molecular genetics and that at a genetic level this has to be both genes autosomal recessive in a cell for the cell to become a tumor, right? Well, with heritable retinoblastoma, the empiric risk, you're right Brad, 6%, right? Where do those heritable genes come from? Well, the first hit can occur in three ways. One, it can be inherited because of a mutation during meiosis in the production of eggs or sperm, <coughs> right? So there's a single bad sperm, and by God, even though there are how many millions of sperm, you know, trying to fertilize an egg, that bad one doesn't. But all the other sperm are normal. In, in, in that ejaculate, and, and there's no mutation in the gamete in, 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 uh, in the gonad, okay? So the dad's totally normal genetically. It's just random chance mutation during comedogenesis. So there's a single sperm, right? So that's one way you get a heritable mutation. Um, the second way, there's a germline mutation in a parent. So the gonads have a mutation in every cell, and every sperm, every egg is, is, is going to have it, right? Uh, I apologize, most of them. And finally, another way it arises is during embryogenesis, okay? So fertilization has occurred, embryogenesis chugs along, and there are cell divisions, and by random chance, one of the two <coughs> retinoblastoma genes has a mutation. And all cells downstream from that event during embryogenesis have the mutation, and the other cells don't. And that's called genetic mosaicism. Does that make sense? Okay. And then there's a second hit that, that happens during mitosis. Like I said before, and you have usually bilateral retinoblastoma, multiple tumors, okay? So the empiric risk is 6%. Why? Well, a lot of that, that first kid, remember here are the parents, I'm pregnant, our child has bilateral retinoblastoma. What's this new baby's risk? 6%. Why so low? Here's why. Here's why. Mutations arise during gametogenesis leaving behind everything normal in the dad or the, or the mom's gonads, right? Everything else is normal there. Or during embryogenesis. And everything prior to that mutation downstream from conception is normal. So their next baby in those instances has a zero risk of retinoblastoma, zero, okay? But the empiric risk is six percent because it could be this presence of a germline mutation in an affected parent. Usually, the parent has retinoblastoma, right? Ninety percent penetrance. But there's a ten percent non-penetrance, and immune surveillance can eradicate tumors in a parent who has a germline mutation, and they don't even know they ever had it. So that's why we look at the retina of parents if we have a child with bilateral retinoblastoma, looking for tumors that are rested because of immune surveillance, looking for you know, a, a regressed tumor. Um, so does that make sense? So it's just taking the average, basically, of all of the risks, right? Yep. But so, so a weighted average. Right, so let's, What's yeah. A weighted average? Yes. Right? Because some of them are gonna be more common than others, so you shouldn't count the ones that are very uncommon as heavily. Because yeah, exactly. <laughs> if it wasn't, yes. it'd be 33%. You, you hit it right in the head. So this situation is not common. Germline mutation in a parent, and the parent doesn't know about it. Yeah. That's really uncommon. What's common is a mutation arising during comedogenesis and a mutation arising during embryogenesis. That's common. Those are more common. 
Exactly. So it's yeah, right. And you're, you're that's way to go because just taking that six percent number, you're like, oh, they have to be more common, or it'd be twenty five percent or forty percent, right? Yeah. So you got it. You cracked the code on this. I'm I'm happy you, you you're saying that. Um, so that's that's all I'll say right now about um, retinal blastoma. But I just want to say this question, in my experience, always seems to come up on OCAPs and the boards. And I want you guys to understand that this is in, retinoblastoma is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, but the empiric risk is just like, has nothing to do with that. The empiric risk has to do with how you get that heritable mutation in the first place, mutagenesis, embryogenesis, or non-penetrant carrier in a parent. Okay? And in this lecture, I'm, I, I don't really plan to dive into uh, genetic testing, but not surprisingly, once molecular genetic testing uh, became reliable, oh, that's fantastic for us, because we can tell the parents, well, oh, there's a 6% risk. They're like, thanks. No, I just have to wait and see, right? That's not really a great answer. But we have genetic testing now. So what we do with the genetic testing, so cool, <coughs> is we take either tumor after nucleation or um, white blood cells in this first baby with retinoblastoma, and we find out the mutations. We find out if it's a missense mutation, a deletion, whatever it is. Okay. Then we know the two mutations. And then draw blood from the parents, right? And we can tell the parents, in your white blood cells, you don't have the mutation. So what does that tell us? That tells us a lot. It tells us a lot. It tells us that the gonads don't have the mutation, right? If the white blood cells don't have the mutation, the gonads can, right? Except one little detail. Parents were mosaics. Oh, well done, well done, yay, 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 you guys are great. You're right, you can be a gonadal uh, mosaic. You, you, can, you can be a mosaic where that mutation, that testing of the white blood cells is negative, but you do have it down here in the gonads, you're right. And so, when that pregnancy, when that kid is born, one of the first things we do is draw blood <coughs> and test for the mutation. And if the white blood cells in that second baby does not have the mutation, it's over. The kid's at zero risk. Because even if that one of the parents has gonadal mosaicism, the gamete didn't have the mutation, or the kid would. Does that make sense? So it's pretty complex, the genetic testing, but super exciting for us, because we can um, stop doing EUAs on the second kid. We don't have to throw all this anesthesia and time, energy, and money at the second kid. All right, so let's move on. Hopefully, I've enlightened you a bit. Not just, oh, memorize 6%, memorize 1%. Um, Coates disease. Uh, grapes, got any grapes? Uh, it's a funny joke that I tell kids that I, maybe later I'll tell you. Uh, Telangiectasias, right? Telangiectasias, that's the hallmark of Coates disease. The vessels are, are leaky and there's exudate. So much exudate, it can be massive and look like a mass, right? It's idiopathic, non-hereditary, 80% of cases are unilateral, males get it more, and the treatments are uh, local, heat and cold. <laughs> this one, persistent fetal vasculature. What's going on with this? The, um, well, first, what is it? You see, you, you, when it's anterior, you'll see fibrovascular plaque that's retrolental. It can be thin like this one. It can be very thick. Um, the membrane attaches to ciliary processes and tends to elongate them and draw them centrally. They're microphthalmic eyes. A hyaluronic artery can be present. Um, and um, um, why does this happen? <coughs> What's the pathophysiology? Well, um, 
there's, uh, there are multiple developmental genes uh, turning on and off during development of the eye, and mutations in those genes during somatic cell divisions probably cause this. The hyaluronic artery is supposed to disappear, right? Well, it doesn't in these kids. And the eye should be a normal size, but it, but it isn't in these kids. It's microphthalmic. So there's an arrest in development. And if the arrest in development is uh, late during development of the eye, you get anterior persistent fetal vasculature with this plaque. And we can get pretty good visual outcomes in some cases by doing surgery, removing the plaque, removing the lens, optical, optical rehabilitation, and occlusion. But sometimes the retina is affected. Sometimes the mutation occurs pretty early in development. And there's the mysterious photo. Remember, I said if anyone knows what that is, they're way smarter than I am. Um, this is what it looks like. This is retinal detachment with this stalk. Same thing here, same thing here. So the whole retina can be detached. It's when it's more severe posterior persistent fetal vasculature. This one has got a story behind it that I'll tell later, but only if you guys are curious. Um, chirpy, flat demarcated lesion, isolated, no big deal, but if it's multiple bilateral, you have to think about Gardner syndrome. Hey, save a life with an eye exam, right? Save a life with an eye exam. Eye exam. Uh, familial adenosis, what is it, polyposis? Help me, help. I need more coffee. <laughs> Familiar adenomatous polyposis, is that it? Okay, yeah, I got it. <laughs> um, and um, so it's a big deal, you know? They need screening colonoscopies and uh, save a life with an eye exam. That's what I say. <coughs> Here's what it looks like. Here's one isolated chirpy. By the way, there's a choroidal nevus, kind of fuzzy edges, um, just for comparison. And so-called bear tracks when they're multiple. Um, melanocytoma of the optic nerve, dark, benign, pigmented tumor adjacent to the nerve. There's a little growth potential. A couple more, astrocytic hamartomas. How do you describe those? How are those described? I don't know. Uh, metallic, well circumscribed, elevated. Do you see any feeder vessels? I don't see any feeder vessels. Right. And you know what? A mass that big, if it's retinal blastoma, it's going to have feeder vessels. Okay. So if you see this photo and you go, oh, on your, your boards, or you look at a kid in the clinic, oh, is that retinal blastoma? No feeder vessels? Yeah. Iris lesions, lish nodules, well circumscribed little mushrooms with uh, neurofibromatosis, right? Helps us make the diagnosis. Kids with neurofibromatosis, as they get older, eventually they develop Lish nodules. Early, like toddler years, it's like one in 10. As they get old, uh, kids have Lish nodules. As they get older, like five, six, it's about one in four. By the time they're 12, 13, it's very high. 80%, 90% have Lish nodules. So we get referred kids with cafe au lait spots all the time asking us, are there any Lish nodules? Because the diagnosis of neurofibrom, type one, at least type one neurofibromatosis is clinical, and it depends on cafe lay spots and how many you have, inguinal freckling, Lish nodules, optic pathway glioma, um, and so we're, we're asked to look, here it is, here's the prevalence, it goes up like that. That's Lish nodules, okay? So it's just a matter of time before you get them if you have type 1 neurofibromatosis. So when's the appropriate time to send them over to you guys to look for the schnodules? If there's a suspicion of neurofibromatosis. Yeah. yeah. So kids usually uh, with no family history of neurofibromatosis have multiple cafe au lait spots, <coughs> and that's when the screening gets rolling. But do you like, ask them to wait until they're, like, say, three or four? Otherwise, it's like low utility, or like whenever it is. No, the, the geneticists have a soak early. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and in little kids, you don't have to use a slit lamp. You can use a 20 diopter lens and get in close with the indirect. You get pretty good magnification. And if you sing songs and tell stories and make gorilla noises, sometimes they'll 
let you examine them. JXG, anyone ever seen this? Anyone ever seen this? Spontaneous high female, right? That's, that's sort of the, the OCAP teaching point. Spontaneous high female. This is in the differential diagnosis, in a child in particular. This is in the differen differential diagnosis. Here's, here's a very big one on the iris. And here, here's the skin lesion. Uh, a little more sinister, medullary epithelioma. How many have I seen in my career? Pretty much uno, right? So it's pretty rare. Uh, I've been doing it 20 plus years, so pretty unusual. But um, its uh, origin is the non-pigmented epithelium of the ciliary body iris mass in the first decade. And really there is a spectrum of aggressiveness where some are fast growing and aggressive, others are very slow growing. Um, a nucleation is curative, but also local therapies with resection. Um, and uh, the shields are doing um, um, resection, cryo, a couple other local treatments, I can't remember what else. But in any case, it's, you know, its presentation is pretty, pretty uh, pleomorphic. I mean, it, here it is, it's, it's sort of a whitish, um, flat, retro-irritable uh, growth. Here's just a circumscribed, circumscribed iris mass. Here's the one I saw, very unusual. This mass right here with hyphema, it grew quickly. This was an aggressive one. I, I wasn't sure what this was, but ultimately, ultimately the path showed medullal epithelioma that I was enucleated. Okay, back to the quiz. We're wrapping it up now. So what does this look like? Two masses, eye full of tumor, creamy, yellow, retinoblastoma, right? What do you think this is? Yeah, why? Calcium. Absolutely. So this? Like if I saw that in the clinic and someone said, what is that? I'd say toxicrisis, um, retinoblastoma, um, occult trauma with an intraocular wooden foreign body. I mean, I could, there's just no way of knowing what that is, but the CT shows us calcium. So it's retinoblastoma. <coughs> this one? Codes. Yeah, why codes? What do you see? What do you see here? What are these little things? What are they called? On the vessels? Mm -hmm. Telangiectasias, microaneurysms, what do they do? They're leaky, right? There's exudate in the retina. This one? That's the hard one. Yeah, that's the hard one. So this is another one. Well, let me tell you the whole story because it, it's, uh, it, it taught me something. Um, so this kid, could this be retinoblastoma? Look at this elevated area, and these vessels don't look dilated, but you don't want to miss with cancer, right? So it's kind of uncertain. And uh, what else could this be? Fever. Yeah. <coughs> Radius. The other eye was normal. So now I'll give you more clinical information, but you're, you're right, fear. Any, anything else? You, you could pretty much say anything, and I'd say, yeah. Any other tractional retinal detachment? Yeah, yeah. right. Why would that occur? Like ROP, uh, which is, I think of fever and ROP as sort of like cousins. They're sort of like cousins. One's genetic, one's from prematurity, but they, all, they both end up with detached retinas, right? Um, and what happened with this kid is that um, he didn't have calcium. The eye was, uh, the axial length was slightly smaller on that side. Um, and, uh, and I thought, this is bigger than I am. And I referred him to Abramson in New York. The kid had a flat hair gene. And um, they recommended a nucleation because they, they said it was uncertain that, that, that could, still had a chance of being RB. Then they went to the Shields, got another opinion, 
And they said the same thing, flat ERG, no visual potential, still some risk of retinoblastoma. So explain to the family um, that the risk of retinoblastoma is low, but we can't rule it out. There's really no safe way to do a biopsy. You can't biopsy retinoblastoma. You drag tumor cells out of the eye and inoculate the kid. And the kid needs chemotherapy at that point, right? So you're sort of faced up. So I prepared the family. I said, we, we have to prepare psychologically that we remove the eye and it's not cancer. And we have to prepare for that psychologically ahead of time. And I, and I really drove that point home with two, two second opinions from experts. We remove the eye and it was persistent fetal vasculature. And the family was relieved it wasn't cancer, but they also said we never would have removed that eye if we'd known it was cancer. I can't believe we did not. And so it's so hard for us to get our head around this stuff. It's so hard. Um, and, uh, but they all lived happily ever after. It was, it was behind them. And the kid got a prosthesis. And uh, I still see that kid occasionally. Um, this one? Right. Why, does it, why, do you, why is it? Just tell me the clinical features. The remnant of the hyaloid artery and the posterior aspect of the lens. Right, like a retrolential membrane. Right on. And these are small eyes. It'll be micropathalmic. The cornea will be smaller on that side, usually, in the clinic. And then when you, if you do an ultrasound, you'll see the axial length is shorter. This one? Yeah, why, why? No vessels. Yeah, there's no, no feeder vessels. In a tumor that size, yep, there would be feeder vessels. This one? I, have, I didn't talk about this one. Differential, this is, a, this is a, look at the date of birth. 124, 2011, image done 527, 2011. That's a baby. That's, I'll, just, I'll just tell you, because I didn't talk about the lecture. It's an iris epithelial cyst. Uh, this one, though? Uh, right, right. Look, it's kind of a, a mass, right? The reason I threw this in is that these are fluid-filled cysts. So that's not medullary epithelial. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, no, one more. Right on, right on. OK. So uh, with the irises, is that the one where they have like uh, absence of the crypts? Or is that just because it's a baby? I'm trying to remember. No, not that, not that I know of. That's something different then. Questions? You guys good? Okay. All right.